Let me start with the art of war, since that was a good thing. You've done two things with the art of war. You've done your own translation, and then we found you've edited an old translation. Okay, What's going on there? My question is, okay, this is translated by Lionel Charles, it's a hundred years old. Why would anybody do their own translation then edit somebody else's translation? For the money. <laughs> <laughs> there are no rules. Well, it's there are no, well, that's it's a market that's an economic <laughs> marketplace. There are rules of the market. <laughs> You're joking. I'm not You're joking at all. I hate the art of war. It's a horrible little book. Which one? This one? The art of war, yes. It's a very nasty book. It's the dark side of Chinese culture, you see. It's, oh. the book that, it's the book that all the bad people in China basically um, use as their kind of, you know, guide to life. I mean, people like Xi Jinping would have read it from cover to cover. Oh, about right? Xi yeah, Chapter yeah. 13 on espionage. Have a look at it. Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. And all that stuff. It is the, it is the unspoken, um, underlying dynamic of, of Chinese society since two, 2,500 years ago. So it's fascinating, but it's really nasty. And if you, if you read the introduction to my translation, I say um, that it should be read very critically and with, you know, with, with, with great care because it's a very, very insidious little book. But you see, to go back to your question, why? why? I, was, I was on a plane from Adelaide to Canberra with a gentleman called Roger Ames who, who had translated this book himself. And his approach to translation was completely different from mine, but you know, we had spent a very nice week in Adelaide and we were chatting on the plane and I said to Roger, um, oh, they've asked me to do the art of war. What do you think I should do? And he said, John, you've got to do it because you'll earn money. Because his translation, he said, earned him 25,000 US dollars a year. I mean, this is the real world. OK, yeah. how much money do you get? <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a, a debate last week about literary translation. Poor old Harry Adley was saying, mm. don't go into literary translation. Mm. You make the mm. money. Tell us. You know, literary translation is absolutely um, it's a, the worst possible option in terms of your professional life. But the one exception to that in my life has been the art of war. Right? The very How much? Look, I'm not going to be the Australian taxation office. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first royalty check I got, I bought a grand piano. Does that give you some idea? Uh, okay. I'll tell you how much the grand piano costs. I'm not saying it's identical, okay. it costs 12,000 euros, okay? right. and that was a six-month royalty statement. Uh, it's more or less so you really like the other guy? <laughs> very very close, you do the very first, yeah, okay. and so I did it. And then, of course, um, it, it sort of got onto the market and people read it, and, um, and these people, they're, they're, they're a company called Tuttle. Tuttle comes in that wonderful film Brazil, do you remember Tuttle and Buttle? Anyway, Tuttle are about as completely incompetent as publishers as Tuttle is in, in, in the film of Brazil. And um, they asked me to write an introduction, and they offered to pay me well, so I did it. So it only took me about a weekend. I mean, one has to do things to stay alive. I have to feed my dogs and things like that. You know, it's very your dogs do very well. <laughs> they, they prefer higher quality food than I right now. So, so I, think, I think the answer is very simple. Very, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing fancy about my translator of the art of war. It's just um, from page one to the last page. But there are some nice little sneaky bits in the commentary where I have a bit of fun, because I couldn't resist that. Um, and it, it is an important book, because people read it. It's one of the few books, that, it's one of the very few Chinese books that is read by mainstream readers all over the world. I, can, I really can't work out why. It's put on reading lists for MBA, you know, stuff like that. Read the art of war. The great, and it was very well, business people love it. I know, but I, I don't understand why. I couldn't say anything terribly interesting about about business. I don't think. Anyway, that's my personal view. And of course, during the war, RAF pilots they had a special translation done for them because they, it was reckoned to help them fight the Japanese. You know, in the war. I don't quite know why. You imagine you're up in the sky in a sort of you know. Um, I want a Spitfire, and you've got to, there's a Jap, you know, let's have a look at the art of war, what's going to be now, kind of thing. I don't think it really helped them, but it was literally commissioned by the RAF during the war. And, and they, they were all issued with copies of the art of war. And my, my translation was actually sent to George W. Bush, as a kind of practical joke, I think. 
you know, during one of those Iraq fiascos. And um, also a copy was sent to Kevin Rudd when he was Prime Minister of Australia. So this book ends up on people's desks, you know. I wish I could say the same for any of the other books I've translated from Europe. Is, it trans is the old translation not as good as yours? Let's um, that it's a very good translation. That's why I agreed to do the forward. Ah, okay. I mean, Lionel Giles was a quite exceptional person. His father, Herbert Giles, was a real bully and um, fell out with all his sons, except for Lionel. And Lionel ended up working in the British Museum and was actually a, probably a better scholar than his father and did a lot of his father's work for him. And his father then published it under his name. You know, that's what happens in mainland China these days. You know, professors all publish their graduate students' work as if it's their own and go on to buy Mercedes Benzes and apartments in Shanghai. Well, in the case of Lionel Giles, his father was professor of Chinese at Cambridge. And he, he actually admits in his memoirs that for the last 20 years of his life, most of his output was written by Lionel. And Lionel was a first-rate scholar and a very humble man. And I think his work is absolutely first-rate. So I was quite happy to write a little bit. Okay. Right. It's mostly about Lionel Giles, actually, my intro. It's yeah. not about the yeah. Where are you? Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio. There we are. Mm. Okay. You're all penguin, by the way. Mm -hmm. Penguin Viking. Which is getting into the airport kiosks and uh, yeah. uh, you're the man who shapes the image of uh, classical Chinese oh, literature for the multitudes. Okay. Yeah, tremendous so. responsibility. I'm interested in the history of translations of mm. this text. And you can see you just mentioned Herbert Giles. He's mm. he's down the bottom there, eighteen eighty. Mm. with the first English translation, mm. I guess, of this text. Rules. Look at the the different names for the titles. Mm. Okay. Uh, Chinese Studio Lodge of Leisure, which is rather nice. Mm -hmm. Liao Tsai Make Do Studio. I don't know what's going mm. on there. Liao Tsai Studio. Bring your own studio, studio kind of thing, yes. <laughs> Why? I don't know, it's a very bad translation. But, um, your translation? No, no, that one. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the rest? I mean, you're translating in a situation where there are many other translations around. There's this many is all other text. The others are really not, not, not worth thinking about. But Herbert Giles, yes. And he called his strange stories from a Chinese theater. And I call mine strange tales mm -hmm. as a tribute to Herbert Giles because. His translation... Well, you just said bad things about the poor guy. No, no. As a, as a person, um. he was a very irascible and highly difficult gentleman with very strange ideas on all kinds of things, but he was an absolutely brilliant translator. Yeah. You know, he, had a, he had a real knack. He only did two big books in his life. One was this, and the other was the wonderful um, philosopher Zhuangzi. He did a great translation of Zhuangzi in about 1888 which caught the eye of Oscar Wilde, you see, hence my tribute uh, to Jack. We're getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and Oscar thought that Dwozer was the best book he'd read for, for years. Of course, he ended up in Reading Jail, which is perhaps not a good advertisement for Dwozer. But I mean, Herbert Charles did this wonderful translation of Dwozer, and um, that, was a lot, that was a big thing to do. I mean, it's a very difficult work. And then he, and then he also did this um, strange stories from a Chinese dude. He, he chose about 150 of the 500 story. And he did them very well, but he was a creature of his time, so he couldn't talk about sex or any other bodily functions at all, any sort of you know blood or anything like that out of the window. So he had some very peculiar transformations of these stories to suit the audience. That's of a, his a time. Victorian, a British yeah. Victorian person. But he was no Burton. You know, Burton would love all that stuff. Yeah. And wrote a couple of chance, pages yeah. about the strange and sexual mores of the Islamic world. But I mean, um, Giles was not in that category. And in this case, this this very unusual man, Fu Song Ling, called his studio Liao Jai. And nobody knows what he actually means by it. It could mean a whole bunch of things. I mean, yes, I mean, this idea of leisure is a kind of possible partial meaning of it. Some people think it's actually a place name in Shandong, not far from where he was born, because there is a town there called Liao. And then it's like nobody, it's a kind of, some writers just create pen names for themselves that actually mean nothing. A famous case in, 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 of that is the Hong Kong writer P.K. Leung, who called himself in Chinese Yesu, or in Cantonese Yasi. And, you know, 
For years, rumors spread about why he called himself that. And people said, oh, it's to do with the rock band, yes. Because he was, he was, he lived during the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And other people thought it was a reference to some classical text. It turns out that it was just two meaningless words that he picked at random from a dictionary because he wanted to have a meaningless pen name because all his friends were calling themselves, you know, the wanderer of the pink bamboo couch or something. They all gave themselves fancy names. So he called himself something completely nonsensical in Chinese. And so creating your sort of pen name or your studio name is a kind of Chinese literary game. And Hu Sun Lin was a very highly evolved um, uh, imaginative writer playing games all the time and one of the ways in which he played the game was by calling his book by giving it a title that nobody could really understand so Giles I think brilliantly just went right round that and just called it strange stories from a Chinese studio that's you up there now you've been accused of making it sexy I didn't have to make it sexy. It's well, the sexy. accusation was there. Yeah, no, no, actually, that's the different one. I was accused oh, of making okay. the story of the stone sexy, oh. which it is as well. <laughs> but I mean, Liao Jai, I was accused of being consumerist. Okay, that and could be. Well, you just said it's money. So. Pandering to the to the to the to the you know predilections of a Western audience and trying to please them. Well, I mean, frankly, yes, I was. I don't think I don't think what's wrong in trying to please your audience, do you? I think Bruce and Lynn was definitely trying to please his audience. And I, I think that it's a terrible misconception. And this is this was a, a very long critical critical piece that appeared on the Chinese internet mm. from a gentleman of the National University of Petroleum. Uh, <laughs> for some reason he was from that institution. And um, he had a huge grant from the Chinese government to basically um, attack me on the internet for being a consumerist. Mm. And um, you know, I just I just ignored it because I'm no, not it's just interesting here because your translation has come after a translation published in Beijing, mm. then another one in Hong Kong, mm. certainly the one in Beijing, mm. uh, and this is this is happening also with the story of the stone. You've got mm. the Chinese translation mm. of their literature mm. and the Western translation. Mm. And you're on the Western side, whether you like it or not. Mm. And you're, you're getting accused of all sorts of these things. Is that well, that, that's absolutely um, part of the course. I mean, I think that we are, and this is we get to the heart of the problem, if you don't know what I say so, but I think that translating from Chinese has its own very special problems because of the whole Chinese attitude towards their own culture. And I'm not talking about my Chinese friends here today who are all absolutely delightful, you know, and terribly open-minded and so on. I'm talking about that great heavy mass that's calling itself Chinese culture. And in my, my last lecture, I compared it to a closed garden, you know? You were there, actually. And it's like, it's like um, you know, you can never get it right as a translator. You are always seen as the person who breached the wall. You are, you are the absolute you know, archetypal traitor to that culture because you are exposing it to the outside world. You know, it's like you're, you're raping the king's daughter. You know, you're doing something absolutely terrible to that culture. As a translator, you can never really get it right. So as you say, with the two translations of the story of the stone, um, the, one in, the one done in Peking by, by the two wonderful people, Dan Xian and, and her husband, Yang Xinyi, was done according to the rules. They had their rules set down in black and white. This is how you do it. This is the edition you use. You do a literal word-for-word -word translation. You don't deviate from the text. And it must read like a <coughs> translation from beginning to end, which is the official line, which goes back to Lu Xun, you know, who was one of the worst translators in the 20th century, and had this theory that all translations should be what he called yi, hard, you know. Well, he was God, extreme. His yeah, translations true. are so hard that nobody reads them because right. they're absolutely unreadable. And um, he, he had a very bad influence. But it, he wasn't, it wasn't just him, it was the whole cultural attitude that you can't, you mustn't allow your culture to be watered down, to be bastardized. To be well, like Lu Xun was translating into Chinese, trying to open up Chinese syntax, um, which is quite the opposite of these people translating from Chinese mm. into English, exporting their culture. I know, but deep down it's an attitude towards a text. It's a, it's, the text has always been sacrosanct in Chinese culture. You go right back to the very beginning of time, to the oracle bands. I mean, my goodness, the earliest Chinese characters are sacred. They're potent. You don't mess with the Chinese language. 
you do not mess with the Chinese language. It is, you don't ever, you don't throw a piece of paper with Chinese writing in the way it's paper basket, you know? You don't do that because the Chinese language is, is sort of talismanic and sacramental. It, it is unlike any other language in the world in that respect. And this has an inevitable effect on their attitude towards translation. Because by definition, translation is changing the Chinese language into something else. And that really is defying one of the basic qualities of the Chinese language, you know. And anyone who studied Chinese like me or Anne or Claire, any of my friends, we, 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 we become obsessed with the language, you know. Yeah, but you get you, you know? a lifetime of yeah. scholarship too. I'm sure you have something with the same reference. Or not. You have the same reference. Would you throw a bit of Chinese manuscript into the bin? Oh, I'm not going to confess to that. I'm not going to confess to that. I mean, uh, you, yes, one has the same reverence. I have the same, I recognize its power. Yeah. But I'm also, you know, more than aware that I'm, I, I'm not Chinese. So I can never be fluent in my language. And I, 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 I respect it. And I try to come to terms with its power. But I also um, respect it as an outsider, standing outside the culture. That's fundamental. And that is very, very difficult if you're inside the culture, because it is, it is an overwhelming culture. You know, it's, if you try to imagine, you know, Egyptian, the pharaohs and hieroglyphs continuing on through the Renaissance, through the, you know, through the Middle Ages, through the Industrial Revolution, and still, you know, writing that stuff in hieroglyphics, and going back to pharaonic texts, which are still alive today, it's inconceivable. I mean, today's Greek bears no, bears no relation to classical Greek, you know, the culture is something else. There isn't, there isn't a comparison. There is nothing like it, you know. And therefore, it has this very, very built-in sense of um, uniqueness. It's like French culture. The French are so obsessed with the uniqueness of their culture. They see themselves as the vehicle for, French, for, for European culture. And yet, they are nothing by comparison to China. China is, has, has this extraordinary, um, and as I say, overwhelming sense of, of its uniqueness in its own culture, the importance of it. And it's all wrapped up in the written word, unlike any other culture that there is. That written, the written language is so uh, powerful that, it, that it, has a, it has a a kind of, the effect on, on people is, is terribly, um, it subdues them in a funny kind of way. And that, that affects not only translators, but creative writers as well. I mean, for the past hundred years, the Chinese have been struggling to find a modern idiom of writing, ever since 1911, you know, because they always wrote in classical Chinese, which is the essential medium for this wonderful language. I mean, the so-called colloquial Chinese is already seen, was already seen for centuries as a sort of dumbing down of real Chinese, you know. If you were a Chinese writer in the 18th century, you didn't mention your novels and stuff like that. That was just rubbish. That was just light stuff, you know, done done for a lazy afternoon, you know. But what you really mentioned was the stuff you wrote in classical Chinese, whether it was poetry or letters or prose or whatever. Because classical Chinese is the real thing. And even today, even today, there's something of that as, as the Chinese creative writers struggle to find a way to, to make Chinese a modern language. Because it, it's essentially not. And, and, and this affects their whole attitude to translation. And it makes life very, very difficult for translators, I have to say. Anyway, I want to go on to practical things, okay, uh, for translators and would-be translators. When you're working on a text, and yet there are other translations around you, do you look at the other translations? Oh, yes, I'd be very dishonest if I thought I'd never looked at the other translations, yes. Yeah. I, always, I always look at the other translations. Um, I usually try not to do it until I've more or less worked out my own, you know. Mm. Um, and sometimes in the, with the books I do, there aren't any other translations, so I don't have the chance to do so. I mean, when I was working on the story of the stone, um, there were no there were no other translations into a Western language other than Russian, and I don't know enough Russian to read it. So it was only after I finished mine that um, Yang Tianyi very kindly gave me a copy of his translation, and I could then use his translation to, so you could compare. to compare, to make sure I hadn't made any terrible harbors, you know. But on the whole, I don't look at other translations. But you're working on texts that are quite difficult in the hermeneutic demand. I mean, you have to construe meaning from quite implicit relationships. Yeah. You're guessing. 
Well, I don't think that's quite the same as uh, considering meaning from different. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, well, no one is guessing. I mean, take the I Ching, for example. I mean, you're guessing all the time. Okay. All the time. Anyone who thinks they know what that book means is lying, you know. It's, it's just absolutely <laughs> incomprehensible. And what we're trying to do. tell him, though, he's going to buy the book now. <laughs> I say so in the introduction, so it's nothing new, but I mean, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is guessing, yes. You are, you are sort of catching, you know, um, something in the air. Let's go to it. This is the I Ching. Mm. Okay. Translate, no, what is it? The Essential Translation. What well, that's the, the Essential publisher. Translation. That's the publisher. I can't control my publishers. No. John was guessing. It's the Essential Translation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, they, all, they use words like that, like, like, the acclaimed stuff. Well, who acclaimed it? I didn't see anyone acclaiming anything. You won a prize with it. Come on. Now, I've got some questions about this. Uh, before I came here, I visited John, and we did it. I threw the coin. Yeah. He's got three mm. coins, which you have to do, and mm. you do the hexagram, mm -hmm. and John interpreted it. Was my back in it was there, yeah, yes. It was August last year. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, so this book is, is responsible for me being oh, here. Yes, I faked the whole thing. You faked the whole thing. <laughs> That's why I'm here. I, made this. I was under instructions from a higher level to fake it so that you would come, you said. <laughs> Hold on. No, there's, a, there's a serious question. I suspect you believe in the power of that. Text. Oh, deeply, yes. Right. Absolutely. Right, that's why we did <laughs> three coins. Mm. And I had to have the fervent desire for mm. knowledge, which I did at that stage. <laughs> Are you in Europe or in Australia? It's mm. not a trivial question. Mm. And it did work. Mm. I remember it did, yes. Yeah. It always works. Yeah. Yeah. It always <laughs> works. <laughs> now you can sell the translation. Never let me know. You know. Never. So, Here's the real question. I mean, others have believed in, in spiritual guidance by the author. I think Jackson Knight was translating Virgil and things like that. But when you're translating and you have to make these decisions, is there some kind of spirit channeling going on? Of course. Yes. Oh, from whom? Well, from the spirit. <laughs> I mean, I, have, I don't have a name for it, not Jackson Knight or no, no, Michael no. Jackson. It's just a spirit. No, I mean, others, I mean, he believed that both the spirit of Virgil guided his translation. Oh, I see. No, I, don't, I, wouldn't, no, no. I mean, I wouldn't go so far as that. In fact, of course, the I Ching has no single author anyway. Mm. But I mean, I think I put it much more, much more childishly, which is that I think as a translator, there comes a point where you know, when you're an alcoholic and you drink a lot of wine, they always talk about some of them suddenly a click, you know. You know, you have to go on drinking until there's a click, and then, you know, your brain... Well, that's that's when you fall on the floor. <laughs> well, <whatever. laughs> but at that point, you've done enough, right? Well, yeah. Now, when I, I find that um, maybe, maybe translation is addictive in the same sense as alcohol, because I find that there comes a point with, with any of the projects I've worked on, small or big, when, when something clicks, you know, and you suddenly realize that you are actually in tune with something. And you say, I can put this in all kinds of fancy yeah. language, but I'm not going to. I could say it's to do with the Tao, you know, the Tao comes before words, before things split into the yin and the yang, there was just the Tao, you know. And if you go through the yin, through words and the yin and the yang, eventually you'll get to the Tao. That's a load of codswell, you know, I mean, I'm... You're going to sell the book, John, aren't you? <laughs> no, but I mean, look, I do, I am being truthful when I say that there is a moment when you when something clicks and I could I could talk about it in relation to the strange tales for example I spent years um, trying to work out what the hell was going on in those stories I don't mean the, the, the plot outline but what the author was on about you know what was his kind of um write these weird stories what was he doing you know and what was the key to it because you read all these commentaries and, and they don't seem to be helpful at all and there was a, there was a particular moment when I suddenly realized what he was doing. And no one I've ever read had ever had the same understanding of him, which is that he's having fun. You know, he's a very mischievous person. And he's, every, each one of his stories may have 15, 20, 100 allusions to the classics, because the poor guy spent his life trying to take the exams and failing. So he had to memorize all these classical texts, you know, some of them quite long. And he had them all up here. And every time he failed, he went home and, you know, started all over again. He would have given up, you know, but he didn't. And so we had all this stuff. And then he wrote these stories, and in the most wonderful way, he, 
he took the mickey out of all the classics. You know, I could give you some examples, but it was not really the right time. But I, mean, I realized suddenly one day, my God, this guy's having fun at the expense of his entire classical mm -hmm. exam education. And once I realized that, well, everything was thrown into place. And you know, it's like looking for mushrooms. You, you look for the first five, and then you see the next ring. And once you've had enough mushrooms, you see the whole forest of mushrooms. <laughs> I'm not talking about ordinary mushrooms, either. Yes. The thing is, you know, it's, it's like the same with, with Pulse and Ring. Once you, once you get what he's trying to do, it all makes sense, you know. And I think that's... Okay, but how do you map that on to Western culture? And what struck me is looking at the translations the first is the degree of Latin that well, now you want to ask about the Latin. Well, <laughs> if he's playing with his classical culture, you're playing with ours. So why? Why is it? this is the beginning? You're talking about the eating, or you're talking about the strange well, both, but but it it, it occurs in the, the strange tales. Oh, I don't use Latin. Well, why would I you call say homo and then that's a good chemical homo? Yeah. Well, in a elixir of immortality, it's maybe our Western medieval references. Okay. I'm not allowed to do that. No, you're allowed to do that. <laughs> you're allowed to do that. <laughs> and is that related to him? I mean, you can't tell us in your translation the classical text that he's writing against. You can't explain it without allusion. Sure. No, that, that, that's not a case of him writing against the classical text. That's just a case of trying to tell the reader that Chinese alchemy is not that different from yes. Western alchemy. Okay. Right? Because I think, to go back to the whole thing, I think translators basically do rely on some kind of universality of the human heart and mind. You know, if we didn't, we might as well give up. You know? We have to basically work on the assumption that People are people, and dogs are dogs. And I don't translate for dogs, you know. I translate for human beings. And they might be English, or Chinese, or French, or whatever. And therefore, what I'm saying there is that, you know, um, to understand the story, just imagine that these Chinese alchemists are a bit like, you know, yeah. um, Western alchemists of, of the Middle Ages, yes. That's You've con consciously inserted that. Yeah. Kind of it's what in my lectures I call cultural sleight of hand. And here's another one. Uh, this is now in the I Ching. You do it all the time through the translation. Mm. You're sneaking in a bit of Latin. Mm. It's like Harry Potter, isn't it? Curriculum. <laughs> I've never read Harry Potter. <laughs> I don't well, they do it. They have Latin for their magic spells. Absolutely, yes. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to explain exactly yes, what I'm trying to do there because do. it's very specific. Um, you see, it goes back to what I was saying. The I Ching is the most wonderful, but nobody really knows what it means, right? And they tend to sort of mumble it, you know, as if they do. And then, because it is incredibly powerful, despite the fact they don't know what it means, it tells them stuff, right? So it's got this kind of mumbo jumbo sort of quality to it. And people, a lot of people know little phrases from the I Ching without really knowing what they mean, okay? And they're sort of part of the, they're part of the common heritage of the Chinese people. And it goes right back, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years. It's terribly ancient now. How the hell do you get that across? And I had this idea once. I don't know if you've seen the movie, The, the, um, the Name of the Rose, right? Do you remember the character in that called Salvatore, the heretic, who wanders around that monastery saying, you know, penitentiani te, you know, draco in cielo, and he's, he's speaking a mixture of Provençal and Latin, and it's all half remembered heretical stuff, right? And he has no idea what it means, but he's the sort of crazed heretic. In, that, in the book by, by, by Echo and also in the movie. And he's very, very good. And then I thought to myself, what I'll do is I'll just occasionally, I mean, not very often, occasionally pop in a little bit of, I mean, <laughs> Latin, Latin is, is, is the perfect vehicle for just insinuating to my reader, oh, by the way, this is partly wonderful stuff and incredibly powerful, because I've said all that. It's also mumbo jumbo, you know. And you just sort of, if you just say Draco Volangincello, mumbo jumbo bumbo bumbo, you're kind of getting a certain level of the eating, which is very true, true to what it is, you know. Because you, you know, I, I, I've given talks in Shanghai and Peking about the eating, and my, my my audience come up to me afterwards and say, we much rather read the eating in your English translation than read it in Chinese because we have no idea what it means. You see what I mean? And yet they want to read it because 
because it's everyone, it is the number one classic. It is, of all the classics, it's always called the first classic. And it's neither Taoist, nor Confucian, nor Buddhist, or anything. It's this, it is the most peculiar book ever. And yet it works, and yet it's, it's read. Even today, new, new editions come out 10 or 20 a year, a, a year, purporting to have a new understanding of the I Ching, how the I Ching explains quantum physics, or DNA, <laughs> or whatever, you know, you mentioned it. Um, uh, the internal combustion engine, it's all there. <laughs> because basically there's nothing there, you see? And if there's nothing there, you can put anything you like into it. It's the most wonderful empty space at the heart of Chinese culture. It's an empty space. And that's what's so perfect about it, is that generation after generation put into that empty space whatever they wanted to. And in, in the Song Dynasty, it was the Neo-Confucians, they had their stuff to put in there. And there were, there were Taoists in the 18th century, there were these wonderful Taoist monks who put stuff in there. So I'm putting stuff in there myself. Well, there I would imagine you're being quite literal. I mean, if you've got an incantation, the incantational oh, yes. text. Oh, yeah. The basic strategy is go word for word as much as you can and write Latin, uh, put danger into Latin, right? Mm. And that need not be too complicated as long as it sounds wordy. But then we've got all these commentaries. Oh, yes. And where do these commentaries come from? Is that you or your copy? No, I do spell it out in, in great detail yeah. in, in my um, introduction. I use, I use um, one main commentary, an 18th century Taoist commentary, which I like very much. <coughs> and then I use various others as well. I, and I put together a sort of, um, uh, a sort of um, running commentary of my own, composed of these. Yes. And I, I, in order not to confuse my reader, I put the exact sources of everything in, in a, in a, on, my, on my website in 70 pages of references so that people, if they want to, can follow these up can go to Liu Yiming or you know Zhu Xi or whoever it is, because otherwise I feel I'm cheating. You know, I want them to know that this is all. You see, I make a point in the beginning of this, saying I don't want to do another Richard Wilhelm translation that's all full of Kalgusab Yomans. I want to do a Chinese version. All my commentary is based on Chinese stuff. It's a Chinese, in that sense, I'm trying to make my peace with Chinese culture. Yes, I mean you are yeah. filling in the void. Yeah, in a sense. Like you've got yeah. the void in the verse, but, but you're giving lots and lots of information with different interpretations, yeah. including one from business management practice. Yeah, exactly. Like that, right? Exactly. I'm very happy about that because the gentleman who did that was a friend of mine in Hong Kong, professor of business studies, and a lovely guy. Who, and you see, he taught business studies for years and years. In fact, he founded the business school at a Chinese university. And then quite later on, an American student of his said, had he read the I Ching, which is not how you pronounce it. But anyway, and he said, no, I hadn't. He hadn't read it, although he was Chinese. So he, he, and this American said, you better go and read the I Ching, because it'll tell you all about business. So Professor Moon, the same name as mine, Min, he went home and read the, read the I Ching. And he was absolutely astonished by it. what a wonderful book it was in terms of making decisions about life. And therefore, of course, about business. It's far better than the art of war. Much better, a much more useful book than that. Well, mainly because it says such sensible things like, hold on a minute, don't go rushing into a decision. Think very hard about the consequences. And then it, it, it is right to see a great man. You know, That means go and ask someone for advice. Don't just rely on your own impulsive you know, decision-making process. Think very hard. And, and also, it's always saying, you don't realize how complicated your situation is. Open the window, open the door. There's stuff going on out there that you really need to, in order to process all the different inputs. And that, that's part of the I Ching, and it's a very salutary thing to be told that, you know, when you're trying to work out whether or not to buy shares in, you know, some company. Or, no, I've never bought a share in my life, but whether or not you're going to get married or whatever it is that people do, you know, you can consult it and it will nearly always tell you to think very, very hard and very slowly and very carefully about your decision, which is in itself 90% of, of, of the whole thing, you know? I, d I just like the way it comes up with these really practical little pieces of advice. Oh, sorry, I don't know. Um, and right at the bottom there, it's inauspicious to marry during a thunderstorm. 
I'll remember that. I love that. Okay. Little bits and pieces like this. <laughs> well, quite practical. Very well. sensible indeed. Very yeah, good. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Charge your battery before you take the phone to some remote place. Yeah. Stuff like that. Very <laughs> simple advice. <laughs> <you know. laughs> Don't give your your bank code to even your best friend. Yeah. It's very, very sensible. I'm well. sure that's all in the IT. <laughs> it will be there somewhere, you can be sure. Everything is just to give people an idea of how the commentary sounds. Uh, so that's your voice, though, stringing together the, the various Yeah. yeah. But very seldom is it anything that I say. It's almost 99.9% .9 based on one or other of, you know, a dozen different commentators. Okay, let's move on to Honglume, I think. Mm. Uh, in your lectures, you use the Chinese name mm. quite systematically, although the Chinese translation is Red Mansion Dream and the translation you inherited. I'll never get to. Oh, of course. Yeah. that. Uh, Dream of the Red Chamber, Story of the Stone. Okay, uh, we're into the thing of titles again. Mm. Uh, Is it any wonder that you criticised? I mean, if there's... <laughs> if it says red in the Chinese and is translated as red, and we, we, we can know what the colour red means in Chinese culture. We see joy, bliss, happiness. We know that Chinese red is not Western red. Mm. Is it necessary to change the title? I, I don't think there are any rules, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for that one. I mean, you're but it's not, me up to it's say not that. entirely random either, is it? Um, no, but you could go one of several ways. I mean, David could have decided, OK, I'll use red, but I'll, I'll somehow use it in a special way. But for some reason, because he was, you know, he, he spent four years in Peking after the war, and he was, he was absolutely um, permeated with a very strong sense of old Peking culture, especially Peking. And he learned his modern Chinese from Manchu, a retired Manchu official. And, and for him, his, his experience of Chinese was very personal. And I think because of that, um, he had a very deep, intuitive feeling about the word red. I mean, and and um, and uh, and and of course, in this novel, it permeates the whole novel. It's a red novel from beginning to end. So yeah. why not put it in the title? Well, because David just felt it was simply um, not going to work in English. Because every time he tried it in red, it, he just felt very, very um, awkward about it. So he decided. He says in his introduction, the nearest I can get to this is gold or green. You know, and of course, the Chinese hate that. And there were long attacks on him published in China saying, where has the, all the red gone? You know? Yes, that's it. That's I mean, it's because you've got the translation published in China. Yeah. Mm. We're, we're in that debate. Other things that you brought out in your lecture, oh. I, I really like this example. Oh, yeah. The, uh, brocade fragrance. Of the brocade fragrance court, which is the Yang's translation, mm. right? And, and then you pointed out that uh, it's David Hawkes who used budding grove. Mm. Because? Well, it's, it is, I, I mean, I, I noticed this years ago, and I couldn't understand why he did it. It only, like I said, these things click sometimes. It only clicked a few months ago, actually. I suddenly realized what he was doing. And then he was just having an idle thought, and he thought, oh, I think I'll call it Budding Grove, which, of course, is the title of the second volume of Scott Moncrief's translation of Proust, in which, in which volume the, our young hero meets a lot of ladies of somewhat dubious reputation at a seaside resort. And, and if you look at the um, movie of it, they're mostly wearing very few clothes and lying on the beach and looking rather gorgeous. And it's all about the our young hero entering the demi monde of the French kind of, you know, what you yeah, so, so just that selection mm. maps an entire experience onto a Western experience. Yeah. I'm not sure about this mapping thing. But you're, you're Sorry about that. <laughs> well, well yeah. evokes yeah, well, the Proustian experience I, within this. Well, yes. Well, he's, it, it's very clever, and he does it all the time because he's a master of this. But it's also westernizing the novel. 
I don't think so, no. I, 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 this is a, a matter of, of, of personal judgment. You see, I believe that, that and I followed him in his footsteps. I, I was, I was a, a very feeble imitation of what he was doing, but I believe you get to the end of that novel, and it's an intensely Chinese experience. It's Chinese from the first page to the last page. I don't think this kind of stuff changes that at all. This is the great misnomer that you have to, that you have to be faithful to a culture on a literal level. I don't believe that. I believe what he's done here is is going to win him brownie points in heaven. You know, he's accused, or you are, you're both accused, oh, yeah. of uh, being reader oriented or translated for the audience and not the text. I don't think that's true. I do not. I I, I do not. Confess to that crime. Okay. <laughs> it's the whole sort of domestication, foreignization. Yeah, do you think that's just a false dichotomy? Like map it onto theory. Is there any translation? <laughs> one or the other? No, good translations are both. I know, I've heard you say that yourself. I can point you back at yourself. You can put their games on each other. I mean, a good translation is essentially both. There's no. There's no you don't have to choose between the two. It's not a little Sophie's Choice thing. Yeah. You could be both. <laughs> and I think David is terribly, terribly, terribly wedded to that text of all people. I mean, he cut his teeth on one of the most difficult Chinese texts of all, the Songs of the South, the Chu Tzu. And he wrote a textual PhD. I mean, he's into text. Yeah. He's a textual genius. He knows all the texts of Huan Long. You know, he's got all 17 of them in his study. He would be you know, looking at this and looking at that, and he writes Chinese like a Chinese person. He writes classical Chinese poetry. If anyone was, you know, wedded to the text, it was David Hawkes. But he's also deeply committed to his reader. So, you know, it's, the, the two are absolutely one. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sort of amazed that a scholar who has devoted a lifetime to a language with that reverence that you have so much time for these translators who might fit into what Venuti was describing. So, but I mean, with Pound and Rexrock, you see, I mean, I have, a, I have a very great admiration for both of them as poets. And I think they bring to their work on Chinese the inside of a poet. And, and that's why Rexrock, when he translates that famous line of Warren Ways, you know, Kung Shan Bu Jianyan, my students are so sick of hearing that line. And I would fantastic Chinese from, you know, um, Burton, Watson, all the way back, talk about the empty mountain, which of course is not what it means because the word Kung has a very deep spiritual connotations in Chinese. And Rexroth as a poet, and as someone who likes hiking in the High Sierra, immediately knows it's a mountain wilderness because the word wilderness goes straight back to the Bible, goes straight back to the spiritual experiences of the hermit, you know, and he's, he gets it. He just gets it straight away. And so does Ezra Pound. I mean, some of Ezra Pound's versions of the Shi Jing are absolutely phenomenal, you know. They want you, they make you want to pick up a guitar and sing, you know, which if you're not careful, I'll start doing. But I mean, <laughs> at least the Ezra Pound you does. Your sh shoes on, at least. I was worried about the barefoot part of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, and even Bernhard Kalkan, you know, that wonderfully dry Swedish scholar, he was the one who said Pound pa was the best. And he did his own, you know, very, very amazing um, version of the Shi Jing, which is, which is entirely philological, because he knew he wasn't a poet. But Pound, who did his thing in the mental hospital anyway, and, and was using it as a vehicle to escape from the way he was treated by the Americans after the war. I mean, he produces this superb collection of mad songs, you know, which, which are all, um, they're all poems. And yeah, he gets lots of stuff wrong, but I mean, I think we have to forgive that, you know, yep. for what he achieves in his form. I, I want to finish with two of them that are of great interest to me, mm -hmm. uh, because translators translate texts, but they also select what is translated and what is reproduced and what gets into to, to textbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, this is volume one mm -hmm. of, of this anthology, Classical Chinese Literature, a monstrous, mm -hmm. monstrous book. Mm -hmm. and, what intrigues me in this, firstly, the, well, the number of, of Judith Gautier, mm. uh, daughter of Théophile Gautier, mm. you know, mid-19th century France, is included here. Amy Lau, Arthur Whaley, mm. Charles, the one you just 
Mm. Uh, respect the one who plagiarized his son. Ezra Pound. Do you see that as, as legitimate work on a par with your translating? I always enjoyed reading about the lives of translators, you know. I guess because I've spent my life translating, and I've spent 50 years of my life translating, and I enjoy it enormously. I mean, I really have fun translating. And I find, I just find it fascinating to read about these people. And um, the story of Judith Gautier, for example, is just a wonderful story. And, and, and then I find myself delving into the past. I'm also profoundly opposed to this whole idea of the best translations must be the newest ones and preferably published in the United States of America <laughs> by ambitious <laughs> academics. I mean, you see, I think those are some of the worst translations and some of the best well, ones. Some of these are very old. It mean, doesn't matter if they're very old. Why does that matter? <laughs> Do you correct matter? howlers, for example? No, I love howlers. <laughs> it's just, um, you know, there's a wonderful example. I'm always given to students that get to talk about Chinese poetry. I mean, a famous um, poem from the Song Dynasty, which starts off um, about how when I was a young man, you see, I heard the rain in a sing-song house. That's what the Chinese says, literally. You know, a Shanian king, you go, or Shan, you see. And a very wonderful translator called John Scott, who's completely unknown, but I knew him very well as a fantastic good translator, committed a howler in that first line by putting the two words rain and song together. And he says, I, some, I heard a rain song, you see, in my youth. What a stroke of genius. And then the whole poem becomes a rain song until the very end. And he turns it into a superb poem on the basis of a mistake, which I think he probably knew was a mistake. No, it's but from he Led Zeppelin. He couldn't resist it. You think it's from Led Zeppelin? It's a beautiful song, yeah. Like, you know, they wrote yes. a song called Rain Song? Absolutely. You've got to listen to it. Oh, come on. You're a musician. <laughs> That's probably why he called it the Rain Song. Well, listen to it. Look at that. Of course, <laughs> you know, Stairway, it's not, it's not the same time as Stairway to Heaven. Uh, no, no yeah, different no. period in Led Zeppelin. You, I didn't know you were in Led Zeppelin. No, yeah. <laughs> you're pretty old. <laughs> anyway, so that, you see, that's a howler. That's yeah. a howler. And D.C. Lau, a very eminently res respected professor of Chinese, who um, was no poet at all, translated that poem correctly, and it's not an event to use for new It's not like the event. <laughs> it doesn't work. Whereas John Scott's is just unforgettable, you know. I mean, it really brought that poem alive. I, I like this anthology because it includes lots of notes about the translation. Mm, that's what by the translators. You get the, yeah. the, the, the I mean, it's only 50 and years. What they said. 50 I can years. imagine that that's uh, quite fascinating just to dip into. And I really enjoyed the stories about the translators and what they thought. And, you, know. you know, for example, let me give you an example. James Legg, who's one of the great yeah. old men of translation, right? people think he's a bore. Michael, I was telling you this yesterday. They think that James Legg was a boring old missionary, but he was, he was a wonderful eccentric. He had a pet crocodile. And he, used to swing it. he used to swing it around his head like that, you know. I mean, someone who does that has to be a good guy. You know? All right, right. <laughs> I mean, having dogs is hard enough. Having a crocodile as a pet, imagine taking your crocodile to the vet to have vaccinations, for example. You would have to be truly eccentric. And James Legg was like that. He was an extraordinary man, quite extraordinary. And the more I read about his life, the more I realize what an extraordinary man he was. And I enjoyed that kind of thing. Mm. Final text I want to mention mm. is political, highly political. Mm. Seeds of Fire, Chinese Voices of Dissent. Conscience. Is, conscience, but it's dissent. Yeah, okay. I think. Well, the conscience, conscience has to be dissent in the People's Republic of China. Yeah. Which you co edited. Mm. And I rather liked the dedication to Wu Shun, who we just spoke about, mm. explaining why there are stones mm. all over the place. Uh, but saying wherever so, there are stones, there will be seeds of fire, you see. Yes. Or Jun. There will, however hard, you know, Xi Jinping crushes dissent, there will always, however hard he try, the Chinese try to destroy Tibetan culture, there will be seeds of fire. Because you put these heavy stones down, as you know, on a camp fire, and the embers continue to glow, you know. And there will be seeds of fire. And they will, they will not succeed in destroying these things, you know. The, the powers of darkness will not prevail. They will not. You don't pull many punch, pu punches with respect to um, the politics, current politics of China. Or should I? 
It's not for me to say. Okay. Uh, but this, I, look, I don't know. I think these texts are translated. It's rather, there are lots and lots of people in there translating. It is a selection of translations, although it doesn't advertise. The fact it's in the notes at the back. Uh, is part of that in all the translations? I mean, when we decide what gets translated, we are conveying an image of a culture. And I think every translation belongs to its time, and that was a product of the mid-1980s. I happened to be in Hong Kong, and I happened to be able to invite my friend Jeremy Barme to come and spend a year, and we happened to have a friend called Ian Baruma, who was the editor of the Far Eastern Economic Review Literature section, and he was the one who commissioned that book Mm -hmm. because there was this extraordinary ferment of new writing coming out of China. New writing, new art, new film, new everything, you know. It was a wonderful time, you know, as words were said, to be alive, you know, in those days. It was fantastic, you know, the 85, 86. And then came the campaign against what they call spiritual pollution. And then came the massacre of Tiananmen, you know. And so that book became was actually described as being prophetic. It wasn't prophetic in the sense that it didn't talk about sending the tanks in, but it did talk about the, the incredible opposition already there in the mid-80s um, from the establishment who tried to denounce these young writers in different ways in the official party journals. So it's a, in that sense, it's a new way of editing Chinese, modern Chinese literature because we gave the party critique side by side with the piece. And in fact, the, the, the then Minister of Culture, a gentleman called Wan Mun, uh, Wan Mun was the Wen Hua Putan, and I met him once, uh, I looked after him for the day in New Zealand, and we had lunch together, and he, he talked about this book because it was quite notorious at the time, <laughs> and he described, he said, of course, your editorial method is what he called Fan Ge Ming Bian Ji Fa, right? counter-revolutionary editorial method, right? Which, of course, it was. It was profoundly um, subversive. And I think, I think in the context of, of China, ever since 1989, for me, 1989 was a turning point. Uh, after 1989, I ceased to engage with China today because I could see which direction it was going in, and it hasn't changed ever since. And we can, we're now actually going through the worst period since 1989, when in 1989, um, the old men who ran China basically ganged together to say no to forces that were trying to open China up to the world, that were trying to introduce basically glasnost, you know, and perestroika. That was why, you know, when, when, when Gorbachev came to Peking, they could see the writing on the wall. My God, you know, the Chinese Communist Party will lose power if we allow this to happen, if we allow these young people. And, you know, two million people in Peking were in the streets, you know. I mean, it was the most wonderful moment. I mean, in May, April, May of 1989, all of us around the world, we couldn't believe our eyes and our ears, you know, but we also had a terrible premonition that it was going to end badly. I mean, I said on the radio in February 1989, this will not end well, there will be blood, you know, and people just laughed. You know, it's like people today saying, you know, um, you know, there will not be a nuclear war as a result of North Korea, and everyone will laugh, of course there won't be. You wait. I mean, I'm not comparing this to that. Have you done the IG? I have. <laughs> no, one doesn't play with the IG. It would be deadly serious. Right. But I mean, and so you see, that book was, a, what I'm trying to say is it was a product of its time, you know, mm -hmm. of a moment in time, frozen. We, we, we just, Jeremy knows everybody in China. He could just pick up the phone and talk to, you know, um, Chen Kai-ge or Zhang Yimo, or these people who became famous film directors were his friends. All these people. He had a fantastic range of network, a uh, range of contacts in China. And I was the sort of um, stay at home editor. I, I dreamt up the, the format of the book, this so called Fang Ming Bian Ji Fa, you know, this counter revolutionary method, which was to give a translation of a piece of literature and then give the party response and see who looks better. You know, We know who looks better every time. You know, It's the authors who look better because they're being. They're being Creative, they're being imaginative, they're being, um, you know, expressive, and then these old guys get up and denounce them, and it's just, it's just, it does in a sense, it is prophetic in a sense because the old guys were the ones who won, you know, and we're still paying paying the price for that today, you know, and and therefore I think it was at its time 
an important book, and I, I feel very proud to have been involved in that particular book. I've never done anything like it since, but I mean, I'm glad to have done it then, at that moment. You have to seize those opportunities when they come your way. And um, I was in a lucky situation. I was able to put it together and have the resources to do it at that time. The financial resources, the editorial resources, and uh, a colleague like Jeremy who was very, very knowledgeable. So at that moment in time, it seemed the right thing to do. I don't know what Thank you. I, I, I've, you've answered all my questions. Okay. Well. It's retiring. Mm. When? Can we a very retiring sort of person? Yes, but <laughs> we've had him at the University of Melbourne for one year. It's been a great I experience had for me. Before, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but you're doing it again. And you're leaving us. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're leaving us from the, at the University of Melbourne. It's mm. been a great personal experience for me, meeting you. For many of the students I know, it's the same. Mm. I would like to thank you very sincerely for the talk today and for all the wisdom. Thank you very much. That's for giving to.